we're losing so much time going from point A to point B that we really don't get as much quality time as, as you would think. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. I'm super excited about today's episode. I know you're going to love it as much as I did. So here at Lavender, we talk about creating our dream life, but our dream life actually also includes the environment we live in. So today I wanted to bring in a guest to speak about how to build a better world. So better communities, better cities, so that we can all live in beautiful places that feel good. Today's interview was so fun and full of passion. I am so happy to introduce our guest, Kobe Lefkowitz. Kobe Lefkowitz is a real estate developer, writer, and thought leader in the world of urban planning and development. Based in New York, and in addition to his own projects at his firm, Backyard, Kobe works with people and cities around the world in the pursuit of creating more beautiful, walkable, sustainable, and dynamic communities for all. Through his On Building Optimism project and forthcoming book, he tries to help people understand why the world looks the way it does and how to create the types of places we all love from scratch. Highlight projects that are doing this today around North America. Kobe tries to marry romantic ways of looking at the world with how to actually implement them in our built environment, something he calls romantic pragmatism. Hello, Kobe. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on, Eileen. I'm, I'm really excited to get to talk with you. Yeah, I'm super excited. I was telling you before we got on air how excited I was to like find your Twitter because this is something that I've always dreamt about. Like, how do I create better cities and communities? But it always seems so lofty and such a big thing that's out of our control. And then I found you and this is what you do. So I think it's awesome. So why don't you start by telling us, like, describe what do you do? Yeah. My, my day job when I'm not on Twitter, or I'm not writing is I'm a real estate developer. We predominantly do stuff in Southern California in San Diego. What that means is we could look at a single plot of land. Sometimes it might be vacant. Sometimes there might be a house on it. Sometimes there might be an apartment building that we'll renovate. And we'll look at it and say, well, what, what could we do? What would make this neighborhood a little bit better? Um, if there's a lot of demand to be near a coffee shop or a bar or maybe a music venue. Wouldn't it be great if more people could get to live closer to those things? And so we tend to build stuff that's anywhere from three or four homes in an apartment building up to 20 or 25. We don't like to go much more than that because then the scale gets a little bit big and you don't really feel as though you're in as intimate of a neighborhood. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more, but a lot of places that are built today are 100, 200, 300, 500 unit apartment buildings where they all kind of look the same. And they feel very big and blocky and imposing. It doesn't quite feel like a neighborhood. You know, they're they're great places to live. The apartments are are lovely, but it doesn't have that sort of charm that neighborhoods that have some single family homes, some duplexes, maybe a small apartment building tend to have when there's a, a great diversity. Yeah. It seems like you have this idea of what an ideal neighborhood or community looks like. So why don't you describe that? Yeah. Well, I should start by saying that. It's different for everybody else, and there can be, or for everyone, there can be many types of beautiful places. So I, I often, when I talk, people will say, you can find incredible beauty somewhere like Kyoto or La Paz in Bolivia or, or in Marrakesh in Morocco. And these places look very, very different, uh, but they're all really beautiful in the same way that in the US, you can be in Santa Barbara or Charleston or New York or Chicago, and they look very different, but they kind of have some of the same elements, even if they might feel like they don't. So these places tend to be uh, allow you to walk everywhere, which is something that sounds like, okay, well, how does that interact with, or how does that impact how we feel about a, a place? You're just walking. Couldn't you do that anywhere? Um, it, it tends to be that when we're able to walk places a little bit more, we interact with them a little bit more and certain things pop out that we might not otherwise see. So it matters how tall the buildings are when we're on these streets, how narrow the streets are. You don't want to be in a place where the streets are 30, 40, 50 feet wide. That 30 is pretty narrow, but 40, 50, 60 starts to get pretty big. It makes us feel small and vulnerable. So we don't, we don't really like that. We like streets where buildings are anywhere from three to five, six, seven stories. Now, some buildings can be a little bit taller and some can be a little bit smaller, but there's this notion in urban design um, called, uh, well, there's some psychology behind it um, where 
we really like to be in places that make us feel intimate and like we're gently being hugged. So too tight, we're claustrophobic, but just enough, it feels really nice. And we walk around these streets and have some level of enclosure and it feels almost like an outdoor room, right? Where, okay, this is a a nice block to walk by. Um, There may be a lot of trees. There could be a lot of uh, dynamism on the ground floor. So coffee shops, barber shops, salons, things to do, things to see. And like I said, that could take a lot of different forms. So if you're in California, it might look kind of Spanish or Andalusian, or if you're in Southeast Asia, it could look entirely different, but the elements are the same. The places, you know, they're at a human scale, we would call it three, four or five stories, a lot of stuff going on the ground floor, a lot of greenery, uh, very easy to walk or bike around. And then you can kind of mix and match from there. Yeah, no, I love that. And I feel like you're very well traveled, probably, <laughs> because you've seen a lot of places. That's something in my experience. I, I love to travel too. And I'm from being from LA. Whenever I travel, I'm always like, oh, in LA, all we do is get in our little cars. You're in an isolated pod and then you go to your place and you don't really get to meet people or see your city. Um, and then when you go to other cities where you can walk, it's a completely different experience. So I, I just feel like the more you travel, the more you see oh, this is how things could be. Like, the, I guess your world opens. So I, yeah, what do you have to say about that? It's an excellent point. And I haven't traveled as much as I would like to. I, I kind of, uh, I can pull the wool over people's eyes somewhat because Google is amazing and you can kind of feel like you've experienced cities that you might not otherwise have. Now, I, I have traveled a little bit. Uh, I've, I've gone to some European cities. I've actually, I've never been to Canada. I'm going to the, for the first time Uh in, in a couple of weeks, which would be really exciting. But you can go on Google Maps or, or see pictures of these places and, and kind of get an understanding for these elements. And so I, I marry the places that I've been and I can take observations from that with looking at other places that are kind of similar online. Um, so you just, do you just go on Google and you like pretend to walk down the street sort of thing? I do the little <laughs> old eye, I drop them down. Okay, when I walk down. <laughs> okay that's well, amazing. I love that. It's really funny. I, and sometimes I'll, I'll talk with folks and they'll say, well, what, what people do late at night on Google is their own business. But for <laughs> me, you know, I, I tend to be on Google Maps in some random city or town somewhere in the world, uh, or I'm looking at a Wikipedia page or reading an article. And it's very nerdy. It's, you know, like I said, people are doing different things at that time of night. It tends to be what I'm doing. And uh, you, I'll, I'll talk with folks and they'll say, yeah, I'm from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, or I'm from Richardson, Texas. I go, oh yeah, you guys have that great coffee shop on the corner. You go, <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, Blackwell's, right? And they go, yeah. <laughs> How do you know about that? I go, well, wow. you, you can kind of you figure gone it deep. out. <laughs> oh, it, and sometimes people are like, you really shouldn't know about that. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, That's so funny. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it, just to to wrap it up. That's such a good point. Of like, yeah, you can be online and kind of understand what these places are like, but you really can't feel it unless you're walking in the streets and talking with the people and going into the shops or or staying in your hotel and, and feeling like you're a part of that community. Um, But it lets me get close (laughs) if if I can't be there. Okay, time for a break with our sponsor, Paired. You might think you know your partner really well until you get quizzed on it. Wilson and I learned about our different perceptions of each other through taking quizzes on Paired. Paired is a relationship app for couples. You and your partner download the app, pair together and every day paired gives you questions quizzes and games to have fun stay connected and deepen your conversations wilson and i played a couple games on the app and it was fun to answer new questions about each other and see what we guessed right or wrong about each other's preferences even after 16 years together there are still new things we can learn about each other Whether you're just a few dates in or have been together a long time, it's time to lighten the mood and have fun with your partner by using Paired. Head to Paired.com slash TLL to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to P-A-I-R-E-D.com slash TLL to sign up today. Connect with your partner every day using Paired. A happier relationship starts here. I love that because I always thought that, oh, you must travel all the time because you know so much about (laughs) these different places. Um, So I I do want to ask you, what inspired you to start writing about this online? Like how long were you just working in this industry before you started writing? Yeah. So I first got interested in the worlds of architecture, urban planning, city building when I was probably 13 or 14. 
bit ago, I'm, I'm just about to turn 27. So more than a decade, almost a decade and a half, which is crazy of looking at this. And I would read as many articles as I could. And I was fascinated by it and said, well, that means I want to be an architect. I should go take an architecture class. So at my high school, we had a, an architecture uh, studio and the class that I was a part of. And I loved it. Every day that we had it, I was so excited. Um, I was also awful. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> terrible at it. Um, probably my worst grade in high school, maybe calculus, but calculus or architecture were, were very close. And so I was like, okay, well, I can't be an architect. I want to be kind of close to it. Um, don't have the design or the technical ability. How can I get close? And I found out that real estate development is you know, basically putting places together where you, you can hire an architect and you can uh, imbue your vision in a place, but you don't have to be the one drawing the plans or doing it on AutoCAD, which made it a little bit easier for me. Um, and so I ultimately went to architecture school because I wanted to be in and around design and try to get better, but I <laughs> wasn't that successful and I studied urban planning. But back from, from then, even the, the earliest parts of, of high school and college, I had all of these thoughts that I would put on my notes app on my phone, or I, I'd write in journals. And even in architecture school, I was the nerd sticking out saying, well, guys, you don't understand zoning and look at these streets, look how pretty those buildings are. They go, we, we get it. You know, we, we talk about this all day in, in class. Um, and so I really didn't feel like I had, even in architecture school, that many people to talk about the creation of cities or what, what makes for good communities or neighborhoods with. And so I started writing just to get my thoughts on paper, because I couldn't really, I didn't really have that network of people to talk to. Um, and one quick funny story on that, I, I think I, I wrote my first article, I don't know, four, four or five years ago on this after many, many years of notes that I was just putting together. And I have a really big family. I, I'm one of six. I'm, I'm actually oh. a quadruplet. So I'm one of four. <gasps> oh my God, that's <laughs> incredible. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I need to see a picture. <laughs> I'll have to send you one after. We, we, yeah. and, and even better, I have twin little sisters. Oh so we are six kids, two pregnancies. <laughs> wow. Very blessed. <laughs> um, but I have, I have a big family. My mom's one of eight. My, my dad, one of three, not as big, but we're very, a big, lovable and loving family uh, who always supports each other. So I wrote my first article and I was really excited about it. It, you know, you put yourself out there. And I know that we, we talked about this before when, when you first started YouTube, it, it's, it can be a really difficult experience to put yourself mm -hmm. out there in a public way. And so I was looking to my family for support and I said, hey, guys, I'm really excited. I have all these years of notes. I had, I've written this article. Here's my first one. And I'm getting texts left, right and center. Amazing. This is really great. We love it. But the beauty of the internet is that you, you have data for all of your articles. And so I looked and sent it out to some hundred people. And I think two people read it, you know, maybe four people opened it. And so if I can't even get my, my fellow quadruplets to, you know, to, to open my <laughs> article, how, how can I write and talk to a better, bigger audience? And, and so there was, when I started writing, it was really just for myself. It yeah. was, especially after the first article no intentions of anyone else ever reading them, uh, you know, and, and then slowly or organically over some years, I, I guess I found my people. And, you figured uh, it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can relate to that. And mine's the same. It's like when I, I started my channel, cause I felt like I had no one in my life to talk about these topics with, and then no one watched my videos in the beginning. <laughs> You're doing it for yourself, um, because you have the passion for it. And then eventually you kind of figure it out you know, the, the audience comes eventually. So I'm happy to hear that from you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it's, it's maybe for some folks who are listening and, and thinking about putting themselves out there, it can, it can make them feel a little bit better because it's not easy. And I think online folks, I mean, well, everyone knows that you, you put a glamorized version of yourself online, but it seems like people who are creating content and who have large followings, it's just always been like that. And they were magically selected, but it's a lot of work and it takes a long time. And if you really believe in what you're doing and you're passionate about it, I, I think you will ultimately find that voice and, and your, your community will come. Um, but it, it, it's not overnight. <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. I'm so happy I found you. <laughs> it got to me. <laughs> um, Okay, so I want to ask you to, to get detailed in how does our community design influence us and our lives? Yeah, that, that's a, a big question and, and something that a lot of people in the realms of architecture and actually psychology and neurology are thinking about today. 
where it can get a little bit into the weeds, but we know through track through surveys and, and academic studies uh, at a high level, there are certain places that make us feel happier, and there are certain places that make us feel a little bit more upset. Um, so sort of the types of communities that I was describing in the beginning, where you can walk around, you have buildings that feel like they're gently hugging you, there is some level of detailing, the materials are kind of warm, so maybe brick or wood mm. or na- more natural materials, and some glass can be, can be great. These places tend to draw us in, and there are certain components of buildings that we feel more comfortable with. And we know that because, well, people say that they like these places. And when, when you go to visit you know, pe- uh, another city, you often find yourselves in New York, let's say, going to the West Village or to Brooklyn Heights or to the, these really lovely neighborhoods. You might go to Times Square too, but you're not really going to Times Square to, <laughs> to walk around and feel the city. But you don't go to the outlying neighborhood that has a large parking structure and all the buildings are spread apart and there's gas stations and maybe there's some concrete buildings here and there. People don't go to those places. No, so we yeah. know from what people tell and certainly internationally. So if you travel, you know, let's say you go to Seoul or you go to uh, uh, Kyoto or you go to Amsterdam, Venice, wherever it might be, people go to the historic cores because those places are lovely. And, and we mm. know from surveys that people say they like those places and there's biometric tracking studies that say, oh, your your heart rate is, is leveled, you, your stress levels and anxieties are, are lowered here. Those seem to be places we, we enjoy. There are other places when we walk by them, we have heightened stress. We uh, have a little bit more anxiety. We might have some even shortness of breath when we walk by them because they feel in some ways a little bit intimidating. Um, so if you've ever found yourself walking in a city where the buildings are, are really large and the first floor maybe doesn't have any windows, or it has very few windows, which it could be a parking garage, maybe. You want to run by that street as fast <laughs> as possible, or you don't even want to go down it in the first place if you can avoid it, right? And those places are, are, are rather harsh. And unfortunately, a lot of our built environment over the last 60, 70 years has kind of spurned this historic wisdom of what makes places attractive for people to be in and said, well, you know, we. It doesn't really matter what the community looks like or how we feel. We're going to build a house out in the suburbs with a big lawn and and a big driveway, and, and that's great. And you'll drive to the mall or you'll drive to wherever you need to go. And that's great because everyone wants to live in a big home with a big yard. And that was orthodoxy in the thinking for a long time. But th- there are, well, while it's lovely to live in these inside these homes, if you wanted to walk around much, you, you really can't do that. It, it's... A lot of cars can be dangerous. Sometimes there's not even sidewalks. Um, and so we're beginning to learn more about these the environments that we, uh, that we live in and the places that people will to understand why people like or dislike certain places. And it can, it really can, can get into a pretty deep rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. No, it sounds like the places we feel good in are more like historic. Like you mentioned, just the way humans used to live before cars, and maybe because cars are such a modern invention, our bodies are not designed to enjoy that, that I guess, that space. Um, tell us more about what what went wrong or like, you know, what are the challenges and the, like what happened to society? Why are we living in these like, <laughs> these types of communities that don't feel good or they're ugly? <laughs> Definitely have to put a pin in that because among architects, words like ugly and beautiful have kind of been rejected, which they shouldn't be. Because well, they but they shouldn't be. Regular people say, ah, oh, that's a really pretty place. I want to spend time there. And, and architects say, no, 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 no. Beauty doesn't matter. It matters if it's uh, intellectually honest or if it makes oh. a statement. And it's <laughs> like that's some architects today, and, and that's a whole other conversation. It would be easy to say that cars ruined everywhere. And I think there's some component of that that's true, but it's really it's really only part of the story. So without going too 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 in depth, um, there, there's a couple of things that happened. So first, in the early 20th century, kind of in and around the First World War, a little bit after, uh, and then certainly after the Second World War, we developed a series of things called zoning codes, um, which basically prescribe what and where can exist in any city. So if you've ever wondered, well, why is all the housing over there and all the retails on this one street and all the offices are out in parks? 
It's because there are maps in cities that say only office here, only residential here, only retail here. And so they all became segregated, which um, didn't automatically mean that we had to have a car. That helped because we funded a lot of highway uh, systems to, to do that. But what it did mean is that historically, if let's say you you ran a bakery and or you ran a, a boulangerie or you know whatever the case may be, you might have been able to live above your storefront, um, mm-hmm. maybe rent out another apartment above in a in a three story building, and go down to work in the morning. And your neighbors across the street could walk over to you, and and you had a real community to it. But that was made illegal um, through something called Euclidean zoning through zoning. And these codes were copy and pasted across America because it was thought as modern and contemporary, where we had all these evils of the past. And there certainly were some uh, some very bad conditions in cities as they were industrializing. So you know, we had these big, dirty factories that were belching out pollution. They, yeah, that makes sense, right? You don't want to live next to a factory. It totally yeah. makes sense. You don't want to live next to a factory. So let's create zones where the factories go over here and this, that, and the other. But it ended up going too far where you you couldn't yeah we want to separate the factories but why can't we have the bakery next to us and why, why can't we have the restaurant next to us um that that doesn't really make sense but it, it became very very rigid it was sort of in this this school of of modernism and in, in modern planning theory where everything had a place and everything had a very hyper ordered reason for being there and the historic city was chaos gave us all of these terrible consequences. We had great pollution. We had overcrowding. We had just really, really dire conditions for many people. And so part of it was well-intentioned. But then unfortunately, as, as is often the case in America, a lot of it has to do with race, where these zones weren't just to move the factory away from, from the elementary school. It was, well, if you're black or you're brown or you're Asian or you're Catholic or you're Jewish... It, written into the codes, oftentimes, you can't live in this community. And that was challenged, obviously, but people saying that's very racist. We can't have this in the codes. And unfortunately, they said, okay, yeah, you're right. We won't do that. But we've already kind of oppressed these these folks. And if we change the laws that to make it such that, well, anyone can live here, but as long as you live on an acre lot, or you live in a single family home that only the wealthiest people could afford. Um, It's not racist by intent, but it it, it really is an effect. And so that's why a lot of neighborhoods still look the same way that they did 100 Mm -hmm. years ago. So Mm -hmm. we have that zoning, we have highways that then would take people out to these neighborhoods. And it was often segregated by use and by class and by race. Then, you know, not to go too deep, but there's also all number of codes as well that say, okay, your house has to be 20 feet back from the street, which doesn't quite make sense, or it has to be less than 30 feet tall. And so there's all these number of codes combined with highways and and roads that reoriented our world from around 1910 onwards. Wow. So it's really been like the past hundred years that a lot of things have changed. Um, Is this just an American thing, like the zoning, or does this happen in other places around the world? It's a great question. So there... It happens in other places around the world. It's a little unique in the US and zoning isn't entirely bad. Some zoning can be really good, but when you layer in a lot of the other regulations and basically all of your development that that happened in, in the mid-century period after, after World War II. So we set these foundations before, some of them before the First World War through the 1920s. And then after World War II, when we had a lot of soldiers coming home and there was, there was great immigration, we needed to build housing. We were in a housing crisis in the late 1940s, similar to the one that we're experiencing today. And so in order to build that amount of housing that we needed, we adopted these these zones out in the suburbs to clear a lot of farmland or what have now become the suburbs um, and facilitated that by, by highways. And mm-hmm. so a lot of other countries adopted this too because they had congested cities that didn't have great conditions that needed to be improved in, in many ways. Um, And so you see some level of zoning in countries around the world. Sometimes it's not exactly the same as the U.S., but um, a lot of development that you see globally, um, you know, post-1950 might not be to the extent that it looks like in the U.S., but there's some patterns, um, you know, certainly in Canada and Australia and and a little bit in the U.K. 
Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So let's talk about like, what are you trying to do now? <laughs> like what, how do you go about changing our communities and our cities given that there, you know, we have these restrictions? Yeah. So I think the, the first thing to do, well, there's two things that you can do up front. One is you can talk to people about it just like this and say, we need to have an understanding of the places we like, the places we have today, and why we can't have the places that we like. Because I, like we said, I, I don't think many people often think about why, and certainly I didn't before I kind of dived into, dove into this world, why our world looks the way it does. You know, what can we do about it? We, we live out in our home in the suburbs. We have to drive everywhere. That's just the way it is, right? It doesn't have to be like that, but you have to have that conversation first. And then the second thing that, that happens could be at the same time, but usually a little after when there's a lot of demand for it is to talk with your local officials, your city council members, your representatives, mayors, perhaps, and planners and say, hey, we, we, we want to be able to walk to go to our school or to go to work. We want to be able to not have to have a car to go everywhere. We want beautiful buildings. You know, we, 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 why should we have to travel around the world uh, to, to see beautiful architecture and walk around lovely streets? Couldn't we have that in our backyard? Um, and so those two things happen at the same time. And what I'm trying to do in my small way is, is to push that forward on, on both ends. So talk to people sometimes over Twitter, sometimes over podcasts, in a lot of different settings and say, hey guys, like we should be building better places. Um, this is what those places look like. This is why we like those places. And it's not impossible. We're doing it in the US. So this isn't some utopian dream. There are people who are doing it, but it's really hard. So we need to make it a little bit easier. And then I'll go back to the other side, to the policy makers and to the local officials and say, people really like this. And not only do they like it, but it's better for our environment. It's better for our communities. It's better for economic development. So all these really good reasons. But we don't get that today. So we have to change our laws to be able to make it possible to do that. Because in many cases, it's illegal to build that bakery underneath an apartment building in America, which just doesn't really make sense. Right. So are you saying those policies, because I don't understand how it works, are they created on the, how, how local or how, you know, how central of a level are these policies being made? It's a great question. And that's part of the problem that some of them are local in your, in your community. So not even in, uh, like if you have an HOA, for example, there's a certain level of law. Then some of them are at the town or city level. Then there's some at a county level, there's some at a state level, and some at the there's national level. There's so many layers. I think just, especially our generation with bureaucracy, we're like, I don't even want to try. It's like so archaic and difficult. That's 100% right. And so oftentimes nothing gets done because you hit your head against the wall and you go, oh my God, what can I do? Um, and so you you have to slowly wade through it. And, and thankfully, there's a lot of really thoughtful and talented people who are also trying to, to do this um, all around the country. And the beautiful thing is just like how zoning codes spread in the first place where one town adopted it and then the town next to it said, oh, we don't want to be left behind. This is what moder modernity is. This is where the world is moving. We can't be that community that doesn't do it. And it spread like wildfire. And these mm -hmm. codes were basically copy and pasted from one coast to the other. Now what we're seeing is people all around the country questioning it. And mm -hmm. one or two cities or then states, sometimes the laws can be preempted at the state level, will take that risk and say, you know what? It doesn't really make sense that we have to require every home to have two parking spaces or every business to have only be on 20% of their lot and then have the rest of it be dedicated for parking. We should probably change that. And over the last 20 or 30 years, people have been changing that. And now it's snowballing to a point where everyone around the country is saying, this is common sense. We should just be doing this. And, uh, and they are. And so it's a slow process. It's a bureaucratic process, but we are moving in, a, in the right direction. So there's reasons to be hopeful. Many reasons, actually. No, that's good. That's good. Um, so in terms of your work, Explain how you envision and start to like build these places to your ideal. Like what do they look like? And then also what's the timeline of, of doing this work? 
A- another really good question. It's one thing to post a picture online and say, this is awesome. We should do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it probably takes like 20 years or something. Right. I don't like, know. <laughs> how, did it, how long does it take? And, and so where we've started is we've started building at a really small, what we call an incremental scale. So we're, we're building two or three apartments on, on one lot at one time that are within a couple blocks of those coffee shops, those mm-hmm. music venues. Okay. And we're slowly going to build up where we'll do one project here, two projects, three projects, four, that will hopefully be really attractive and cool and in neighborhoods that people want to live in and, and that they can actually walk around in. So we're, we're trying to put our, our money where our mouth is. And then we, we do work with folks around the country and increasingly around the world to effectuate those principles in their projects. And so we might not be able to do a, a project in Vancouver or in uh, Singapore or in London, let's say. But we can talk with the people there and share lessons that we've had. And that kind of pushes up the process in a way that if we had to do all those projects, it would take so long, <laughs> um, especially at a big scale. But you know, on, on our little projects, they, they probably take from the moment we have the idea and we buy the, the, the home or the land until the first people are moving in, because a lot of the review is the bureaucracy is still there, it can take us eighteen months, sometimes twenty four months, just to build okay. two apartments, which is okay. Yeah, kind of, that's kind of a long time. Yeah. Um, but there is work being done where people say, "Okay, we know you want to just build uh, a, a courtyard apartment building or a bungalow court," which I'm sure you're familiar with seeing them in Southern California. They're really lovely, like one or two story bungalows around a little courtyard. Um, we know that people love that. We know that that's not going to destroy the community if we let people build it. So we don't have to put you through a year worth of review. If you're going to build this exactly to these plans, you'll get permits in a month. And so there are people that are helping to push up those timelines so that you can move that 18 to 24 month project to a six to 12 month project. Since we have listeners who are probably like inspired by now to make some change in their community, what is something that people can do on just the regular person level <laughs> to push us forward? I love that question. It's it's the most important question. What you know, when we get into the weeds a little bit, which is not for everyone, and it can be really difficult to follow it. So zoning codes, building codes, you know, hit highway history. What, what does that matter to me? It's very difficult to grasp. But our best communities around the world. So wherever you like to travel and wherever your favorite place is, those places were created by everyday people. They weren't these master builders or master developers. Sometimes they were, but usually the best communities in towns were a couple of guys and girls who got together, built one building, maybe built two, and then they had their family business on the ground floor or you know they, they had a community that they built around. And so everyday people are the most important thing uh, in probably honestly more important than architecture developers who have decades of experience to say, no, this is the way it works. Um, no, communities are only made and shaped by the people who live in them. You know, it's not a real community if it's kind of put on you by others. Um, and so what people can do, I think, is to start to talk amongst each other um, if they're not builders or architects and say, yeah, you, you know that that new gas station that went up for sale on the corner? I, I heard that there's um, there's going to be a meeting at the city council um, about what to do with it. I'm going to go there and say, well, why can't we build a new beautiful building? Here's some buildings I really like. I found them on Pinterest or I found them on Instagram or wherever it might be. Or I was just in Italy. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could have a building like that here? And I think that's where it starts. I love that because I never even thought that was possible. Like, let me show you my mood board for my ideal building. <laughs> Honestly, and I'm, I'm not kidding. Mood boards could change America. Oh my God. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm so good at Pinteresting. <laughs> I mean, that that's really where it starts. If we don't uh-huh. have a vision for what world we want to live in looks like, yeah. who's going to go out and build it? it it's this, yeah. I love that. I, I think you realize that the people who are at this like policy level, they're not that creative. And there are probably a lot of creative people who know how to, who know what beauty looks like, but they just don't, they're not in the, they're not communicating, right? They're not in the rooms. 100%. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I had that exact conversation earlier today where everyone is in their own worlds and no yeah. one speaks the same language as each other. But if you could bring them together and have the creative or the designer say to the local official, 
who it's, you know, it's not their fault. It's just not their interest. Exactly. Right? They're, yeah. they're, they're an official because they're not an architect or an interior designer because it's not what their interest is. Mm-hmm. But if they could talk to each other and the person who has the vision can say, this is how our community should look like, you have to get in that room. And that really only starts with talking with each other. And it can be as simple as in a coffee shop or over the kitchen table, or it can be up to going to a meeting, or if you really feel inspired, and maybe there are some people who are, you can work with some people in your community and maybe buy a, a home or land and and you could renovate it, or you know it's, it's a bigger lift. You could come together and build a, a, a home or maybe a new small business. And that can be uh, the seed that leads to a new forest of ideas. And that's more than anything, even though I'm a developer and we do our own projects, what I try to do is to help people realize that they can plant that seed in their community and there's no reason that they can't. And once that seed gets planted and once you build one beautiful place, so I I, I don't know if, if, if you've been to Charleston in South Carolina. Mm. No. It's stunningly beautiful. It is so charming, so quaint. Uh, the Southern hospitality doesn't hurt either <laughs> and being right on the water, but over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a group of architects and developers and everyday people who have just said, we have this beautiful city, but a lot of new places aren't aren't that great. Why don't we try to create them? And they did. And so their one new building turned to two, turned to five, to a point now where if you go to Charleston, almost all of the new buildings are really, really lovely. Wow. Even if you aren't, even if you don't have the vision, you can look to the person beside of you and go, oh, I really like what they did. I'm going to try to replicate that. Mm-hmm. And, and then that kind of goes down its own path. It's like inspiration is uh, contagious, right? Once you have one beautiful thing, it just builds upon that. That's amazing. I have to go now. Put that on my tra- travel bucket list. It's a beautiful way of saying it. And I think you're exactly right. It, it's just like in the way that you, a conversation could have that inspiration, or if, if you post a picture of, of your apartment or of of an outfit or whatever the case may be, people could say, "Oh, I I never thought about wearing that coat with those those pants, but Eileen makes it look really good, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go get that coat." And it's the same exact principle. You do this with buildings <laughs> and cities, and you hope, right? And and then you know. It, if everyone's dressing better, that's great too. And if you know, if everyone is in creating better cities, that is perhaps transformative. Yes, I love this so much. I hope someone is listening and then decides to like become an urban planner and then do, doing what you do. I bet there will be people. I, I'm uh, my DMs are always open. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Um, okay, my next question for you is: What about your work are you most proud of? Ooh, that's that's a really good question. Real estate developers have historically had really big egos. Uh, that's like that is what gets put on them, and not really unfairly. And so there are some caricatures in movies or TV shows where they'll say, "Oh, this is the greatest building that has ever existed." Um, we had a former president who was a real estate developer who certainly, uh, you know, Donald Trump oh, yeah. certainly was in that school and did not give a lot of developers good names by any means, but. He is perhaps a really good example of developers who are way too egotistical, who say, this is the greatest building in the world. No building could ever be as good as this, right? I, on the other hand, you you have a lot of pride in anything that you create. My, my pride would come from if somebody walks down a, the block that our buildings are on, or they drive by it, or, or, they, or they live there, which would be the best. And not that they say for the rest of their life, this is the greatest thing that's ever been created. I'm going to bow down to the altar of the people who designed it. But if it takes a half second or a second of their day where they look over and they go, huh, it's pretty nice. Or or just made them think, oh, I really like the way those roofs look. Okay. And they notice it and then they walk on. That is a really great pride to me for somebody mm. to notice it. Not, not oh. for it to be the greatest thing in the world, but for it to impact somebody's day yeah. in, in even a way as small as that. And I think back to the, the take inspiration from others, if you can compound that, and if it's one building makes you feel that, what if a whole block makes you feel that? And it doesn't just have to be us, but maybe Eileen builds one next to, next to me. And, and maybe John and maybe Jessica builds one or the fourth. And now suddenly you have a street where every building makes you go, oh, that's really, really lovely. I really like walking down it. You play 
a part and sometimes a small part in people's feeling of the world around them being being increased. Yeah, it makes them happier, right? It may, it's like to be surrounded by beauty is like, it brings you joy, at least for me. <laughs> it's very important. For yeah. everyone, it does. To go back to the example, I kind of draw, you go to Venice because it's a, a beautiful city or you go to Rome or any of these places because they're beautiful. Yes, there's history. Yeah, there's pasta and, <laughs> and pizza. And it's great. Um, but you could get that at the Olive Garden out on, you know, on the highway extension, the spur. Why are you going to Venice? Because those places make you feel great and, and they're really lovely in their own right. Um, and so beauty really matters. It, it doesn't like, you know, doesn't all look the same. Beauty comes in a, in a million different forms, but it does matter on its own. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So next I want to ask, what trends do you see coming up regarding like our communities and spaces? Like where are we already moving in this direction? And I don't know, for example, a trend that I see are like people moving out of big cities, right? People like in, in terms of the world, like globalization is kind of like coming to an end and people are going back to their local communities. Like, do you see that or, and what else do you see? So I think in some places that's definitely going to be true. I think there will be large cities that see populations uh, declining, but places like New York, you, you can't, and this is not me being a New York exceptionalist. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff that's wrong about New York. I'm not going to pound my chest and say it's the only place that ever exists and it's the greatest place in the world. There's a lot good about it, but there's also a lot bad too. It has so many amenities. It has so many cultural uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. amenities and reasons to be there and restaurants and nightlife. And so those places, I think, will actually see more people. If, if there's mm -hmm. enough housing built for them, which is a whole other problem, um, more people will move to those places. But there will, will also be a move, and we're seeing this with remote work, where you don't have to be tied to the office. And so in the past, where you maybe had to go work in, in an office building um, five days a week, you maybe only have to do it one day a week or two days a week. And that might let you live two hours away, in a, maybe in the town you grew up, or maybe in a in a smaller or mid-rise community, uh, a mid-sized community. So I think we're definitely going to see some of that. I think the biggest trends are people demanding that they should be able to walk to do their everyday needs. They should be able to bike to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And that you know, cars are really expensive and they can be fantastic. I'm not here to say we should get rid of all cars. I drive a car sometimes when I need to, and it can be a really useful tool. But we wouldn't build our world around being able to hammer in uh, loose nails, right? If every building had loose nails that just needed to be hammered in, you'd be like, ah, that doesn't seem safe. You know, it, it's great that we have these hammers to get <laughs> to nail these, these buildings in. Um, but we probably shouldn't have that many buildings that could collapse. Um, and the same way with cars and highways, it's great that we can get around by cars, but when we orient our entire communities around cars, that seems dangerous and not, doesn't really make full sense. You know, between communities, great. If you're going to the, to a farm, if you're going, you know, out to certain uses, there need to be roads, there need to be highways, and there need to be emergency vehicles in communities too. We still need cars and vehicles in communities, but not to the extent that they are. And I think there's a lot of people who are finally questioning that because they might go on Pinterest or Instagram or TikTok and see a really lovely city or a town and go, hey, why don't we have that in our backyard? Why can't I bike in my backyard? Um, and so I think that's the biggest trend. And then I hope on a, on a smaller scale, there's a trend for making those places beautiful. So it's not just enough to be able to walk or bike where you need to go, but that the whole way is really lovely. And that you feel inspired by those journeys. You know, just just going to the grocery store doesn't have to be a mundane thing. It could be a moment of profound joy, I, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to say this with New York because it's already a very walkable city. But what about like places like LA, like big cities that are built for cars? Like, is the is your vision like in the future we build a new city that's walkable or you try to transform what's currently there? Both. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think we have to, uh, there are places like LA that, I mean, it's 75 and sunny most of the year. It is yeah. gorgeous. That's yeah. a place, I personally think that if, you know, there's a lot of, through zoning, we, we often can't build the amount of housing in neighborhoods that would be able to support it. So, you know, all entire neighborhoods are single family homes or maybe some duplexes when maybe the prices are really high, which is a signal that you should be building more apartments there. Um, so when your rent is really high, it's a signal that there's not enough 
homes because people are uh, competing up the price. Uh, yeah. That's certainly the case in places like New York and San Francisco and LA. I think with LA, we can do really thoughtful infill where, and you're already starting to see this in places like Santa Monica or in downtown LA or the Arts District um, and places like West Hollywood, where you can actually get around in those neighborhoods without really needing a car. And we're going to see more and more of that, which will be lovely. So places like West LA, which historically you've, it hasn't been entirely car dependent. It's, it's very dense and you could walk around, but it doesn't really mean people do that. I think those will be places where you feel more and more comfortable. But I also do think that the US is still growing and there are still subdivisions in places like Texas or Florida or Arizona where you have to drive 30 minutes each way and every home looks exactly the same. You know, and you basically are driving 15 minutes to go to a Walmart, right? Instead of building those communities, which might be great for some people, what if we could take the West Village in New York or Back Bay in Boston or, you know, maybe the, the form of Santa Monica? You can't take the beach everywhere. <laughs> but what those places feel like, or Santa yeah. Barbara might be a better, better example. And instead of building that 500 home division that looks the same, build a village, yeah, you know, if you go yeah. if you go to France or you go to South Korea or you go to Japan, they have these really lovely villages that are entirely walkable, have everything you need, just a walk away or a bike away, and then they have the countryside within five minute walk, which is pretty incredible. You know, so I think we will need some new communities from the ground up that are entirely walkable, but we definitely can't give up on our existing cities and towns. We have to make those better. And that can be a little bit more difficult because you have to reconcile the people who live there and the needs of the community. And so it's a little bit of a push and a pull. Um, but for that reason, we'll, we'll need both. Yeah, love that. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you were to imagine what that new city would look like, like building it from the ground up, what would it be like? <laughs> this is something I've thought about since I was 13 or 14. And I always thought it was crazy. I swear to God, I, I always thought it was crazy. There was this post that I posted recently of a place in Croatia, which I thought was just really, really beautiful and, and seemed to resonate with some people that gets pretty close to that ideal where it's very fine grained. So that means there's relatively short blocks. It's very, you know, it's organic. So you don't have straight streets and grid. You you walk and you kind of curve along. And, and it, that's a really lovely way of moving through a city because you never really know what's going to come around the next corner. And there's kind of a magic to that, right? It's like, oh, wow, there was this really lovely restaurant here that I just didn't expect, or there was a statue or, or something else where these kind of narrow blocks are winding in and out. And I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. We have thousands of communities like this around the world on every continent. And I would just take them and then, so I'm, I'm in New York and New York is a very, and outside of the city certainly has, has its own architecture. When you're around here, there's a lot of, uh, neo, uh, Tudor and, and Tudor revival buildings. There's some colonial buildings. There's some colonial, uh, you know, farmhouse buildings as well. So th there's a lot of different typologies. And I think you take that basic form of like this organic and walkable and beautiful city. And then you say, what are some of the styles that are around in New York? And then what are some new styles? You know, we should definitely keep creating new types of architecture. We should never be content with just looking in the past. Mm -hmm. to make an entirely new and fresh place, but that still feels normal and natural to people, right? Um, and so I think it really depends where you build it. If I built it in New York, it would have those reasons. Um, but no matter where it would be, it'd be a place where you could you could walk everywhere, where you have a lot of different types of buildings, so a lot of different types of people can live there. Um, unfortunately, in the US, we have, not only do we segregate by class and by race, and by use, which is terrible, uh, we, we also segregate by age. So you have senior living communities, or you have subdivisions where families live, and then they have to move out when their kids go to college, and young students might go into the city, and you know we're kind of disconnected. That's true. Yeah, we're segregating everybody. Everybody by every single way imaginable, which is just not the way to create a good city. You know, Any good place is somewhere where you can bump into someone who doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you. And can give you, uh, and that makes your life better, I think, in some ways. And, and it makes us all stronger and we have a better understanding of other people. And when we we segregate everybody, suddenly becomes, 
oh, uh, you know, I lean over there. She, she really likes the color green and, and I like red. And so we just can't be friends. And mm-hmm. everyone in that community just likes green. And, you know, so it's, sorry, we're never going to talk to each other. And that just doesn't make any sense. Um, and it's, it's obviously even more senseless when you judge someone based off their race or how much money they make or, um, you know, increasingly what they believe. That's, there's a lot of tearing of the fabric of our world around us because of that. And so the style, I could go on and on and on and say, here's the 700 <laughs> buildings that I want to put because I, I do have a, a Google we need document. This Google about, slideshow, <laughs> everything. Oh my God. It's like it's like 500 pages long <laughs> right now. It, it, whenever I try to type in there, my That's computer hilarious. crashes because it just can't, it. It can't take it. And so I have a lot of individual buildings and parks and greenery. You know, A really important yeah. park is to have open space and to have greenery as well. But I think the principles of that place where you need to be able to walk everywhere, where there's people who look and think different of different ages, and then everything else, and you know, it's very dynamic. So you have a lot of mix, mixing of uses. Uh, they're not all segregated. And then everything else, you kind of want to let the people figure it out. So sort of what we talked about earlier, where what can the everyday person do? The everyday people should shape the community. You know, there's this running joke that I've, I've now told for like five or six years being comfortable sharing people this vision I have that's called Kobe City. They're like, okay, if you built Kobe City, what would it look like? And you know, you're you're the dictator of Kobe City. And I say, no, 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 that's entirely wrong. If that's the case, it would fail because no one person's vision can be successful. You might be the foremost authority on urban planning and architecture and beautiful cities and design, but you're only one person. And that means you can fall prey to any number of uh, of things where it might make sense for you, but it wouldn't make sense for others. And so we need these places to be shaped by a lot of different hands and for a lot of different people to have input. And that input has to be, I want this to look like this and we're going to move forward. As opposed to today in a lot of America, it's, I don't know what I like, but I know I don't like that. And so I'm going to say no to anything that, you know, that, that is different than the status quo. Yeah, no, I, it's true. It has to be like a true community effort to build a beautiful community. Yeah. Or, or else it's not a community. Right. It, you know, it's a fiefdom then. It's one person yeah. saying this is what it should be. And that just, you know, I have some ideas and I hope to create the foundations for that one yes, day. Yes, you can lead us. <laughs> you guide the project. Yeah. We'll have our arms linked together and maybe I'll do one or two and then you'll do three or four. Um, but, you know, the best communities are organic and they grow over time. And they're some of the best ones, yes, are hundreds of years old, but as I try to feature, we're still creating lovely places today and people are trying really hard. And it's just with time, which is difficult because we're not going to have the world we want tomorrow. Rome was built in the day. right? But if we can start putting those first stakes in the ground in 30, 40, 50 years, and and perhaps well sooner than that, who knows what we can create? I mean, Mm -hmm. we reshaped our entire world in the US in the period of like 10 or 20 years. Couldn't we do the same thing to make it better? we totally could. It's just yeah. about, you know, thinking about it a little bit more. Love it. Love it. And, and going back to where you, you know, you're talking about that city in Croatia. I actually, last year I traveled to Croatia. I went to Dubrovnik and it's like, it's a, it's similar to the city you posted where it's surrounded by water. It's this little town and you can see how back then they, they could walk to the pharmacist, the doctor, the bank, like everything was like within five to 10 minute walking distance. And then there's people of all ages and you know, like your neighbor could be anyone. And so I, yeah. I love what you pointed out, how like we're so segregated now by age, by class, by like use and it's true. We, we're so like, as a country, we're so divided, right? We need to be able to be in a community with people who are different from us so we can understand our world better. And yeah, like, and one thing I always complain about being in LA too, is like, my friends are so far away. Like, wouldn't it be so nice to just walk five minutes to see my friend? And like, then you can have casual meetups instead of planning two weeks ahead. <laughs> like the way I see my friends is like, it's like a 30 minute drive here and there. So there's just so much like quality of life can improve so much if you just bring everything in one little, like a little town. Totally. A hundred percent. And having lived in LA, I, I thought it was a joke when people were like, yeah, I take one meeting a day because it, you know, if I have to go up to, uh, you know, the Valley, it could take me an hour to get there and back. And it's like, that's, that's crazy. You, like, but it's true. You sit in your car and you, you just, what, what can you do about it? Um, 
And then you end up just staying in your neighborhood and you don't see your friend who moved to the valley or you don't see your friend who moved down to Long Beach. And that's a shame I mean, that, you know, it should be easy to maintain those relationships. Such a, a good point that you made about this division that we're kind of sowing in, in our communities by the way we design them. It manifests in obvious ways where we, if we disagree with them politically, okay, we don't have to interact with them. Um, and if we can only have offices and retail in this neighborhood, okay, we know we can't walk to that sandwich shop or whatever the case, or the candle shop or whoever, whatever it might be. Um, but we don't often think about the impact on our families and on our friends. And so th- there's, in California and, and elsewhere in the country, there's been this rise of super commuting where people commute more than an hour and a half in each direction. It's very common, sadly, in in, in San Francisco where housing is so expensive that people often have to move two hours outside of the city just to, to find somewhere to live. And that has incredible strains on your family. Because if, if you're leaving for work at six in the morning, let's say you're a teacher and you have to get to class by eight o'clock and then you spend a whole day, you're working really hard and then you have to drive back and it's another two hours and maybe you're not home until seven or eight. When do you have time for your kids? When do you have time for your partner? When do you have time for your friends? You don't, you're, you're exhausted. And so even, even when the, the notion is that we built suburbs for families, or for communities to go out and have space, we're losing so much time going from point A to point B that we really don't get as much quality time as, as you would think. Wow. Yeah. And time is so valuable. It's the only thing you can't buy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, sit in the car and you can listen to the podcast. Great. But <laughs> this podcast will be closer to an hour and you know probably not too. And so that's... Um, you know, an hour is, is still far. Uh, you can listen to it in a couple yeah, different Yeah, it's parts. so draining too to drive far. Like I, I used to commute an hour to work when I did internships and stuff. And I was like, I can't do this <laughs> never again. It's, it's so it's tough. so draining. I, yeah. And then you're like, oh, am I going to get parking on the other side? Uh, do I have to go to a garage? How expensive is that going to be? It's, yeah. it's a whole mess. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kobe, my last question for you is what do you hope to accomplish through your work in the next 10 years? Like, is there something you, you're aiming for? Oh, that, that's a, that's a really, that's a big one. Um, (laughs) The joke is it'd be great if I could build Kobe city. You know, I don't think that's happening in the next 10 years. Um, But I think similar to flipping on its head, the notion of, of of a developer's ego, where you think your project is the only one that matters. And a lot of contemporary architects don't build to be a part of a, a neighborhood or community. They build so that their structure stands out. And some cases that can be really good, but often it's, those buildings feel a little weird. So I think my goal for the next 10 years is if if people don't need to say it's Kobe or or I saw these buildings that inspired me to go build, but for that people around the country to start questioning a little bit more the world around them and then to take that second step. Because if you just question it, then we're just complaining. And that's not good, right? Complaining adds stress. Who needs it? But to feel empowered and mobilized to take that next step to show your move board to your friends or to the city council or whoever it might be. And for people around the country or around the continent to say, you know what? I really want to have uh, this. I, I saw this d- development in Alabama and I thought it was really good. And I'd love to have some of that in Oregon. Why, why couldn't we do it? And have this cross collaboration such that it doesn't need to come from me. And people don't need to say, hey, thanks, Kobe, for showing me this building that was really cool or for opening my eyes up to these types of places. It's for people to subconsciously then go out and do that in their own communities. And I think that is at a scale that could perhaps be so much more viral than anything I could do or anything I could effectuate. And so if, if I'm a little cog in that machine, in 10 years, we have a world that's a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more walkable. That is a massive success. And that could be as little as a couple of buildings pushing the needle. But I really do think we're at a moment where there is so much demand and there's so much desire to live in these places, especially in the pandemic where people were couldn't uh, leave their homes or their communities. Yeah, we realized how isolating it felt. How isolating. You realize how important your neighborhood was. And you go, well, I can't, I can't go and do all the things that I used to. Wouldn't it be great if I could just bike and do it? But, but I can't, especially somewhere like Southern California where – you should be able to, to go to a takeout window, walk down the street, never have any contact with anybody else and still enjoy being in your neighborhood. So I think that we're well on our way there. This momentum has been building for the mm-hmm. last couple of years and really a couple of decades, but really in the last couple of years. And the world is on its way in the US to becoming a more beautiful, 
accessible, sustainable, interconnected place. Um, and if we see even just a little bit of progress that in the next decade, I'll be really happy. I think we'll see a lot of progress. I already feel that push. I, I, I feel like we're moving in that direction. And I also wanted to say that I think you're already doing the work that you, like what you said your goal was, like you're putting your ideas out there and how many real estate developers are reading your newsletter or your, like, right? Like people are getting inspired because you're posting and uh, yeah, you, you'll never know the effect of that, but it's happening. Not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're well, saying it's already happening. They're looking <laughs> at your content and they're getting inspired. Well, if you set the bar really low for your goals, <laughs> <laughs> then, then you'll be able to meet them. So yeah. maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. All right. Um, Kobe, where can we find you online? So I am pretty much everywhere at Kobe Lefko, C-O-B-Y-L-E-F-K-O. Um, and then if you want to read some of my stuff, uh, I'm on our built environment at Subsec, and that's our, my New York accent sometimes comes out <laughs> where it sounds too thick. Uh, o U R built environment. Uh, if you're looking for an understanding on why the world looks like it does and not just an understanding, but how we can go forth and create a, a more beautiful world. Amazing. Everyone will link it down below. Definitely check out his Substack. I thank you so much, Kobe. I had so much fun. I love your passion and I just like, I'm here for it. Let's build Kobe City. <laughs> thank you so much, Eileen. I really appreciate the chance to, to come on and, and talk with you. It, it's uh, really a highlight of my week. Um, and it, it is uh, always great to, to talk with folks who are interested in this space, but but even more so to talk with folks who, who are outside of it, who know exactly the, the, the things that, that I know or that other architecture developers know. Maybe we talk with a different language, but the beautiful thing about cities is that everyone experiences them or towns and everyone knows what they like. So there's no reason that just because you're, you're not in the industry or in the space that you have any less say. Yeah, you know, yeah. if anything, you have more say, to be honest. Yeah, this was really empowering because as someone like before the podcast, I'm like, how do I even make a difference? How there's no I have no control. And then now I'm like, oh, I, I get it. <laughs> we can do something. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs>